As the prophet Isaiah said, his name shall be called Wonderful. We're meeting today in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church. You listening out the radio, listen audience, appreciate you tuning in for this hour coming up. Mama Sue and I deeply appreciate the beautiful and lovely Christmas cards you're sending to us at this time of the year. She decorates our living room with them each Christmas, and we behold them. We uh, enjoy them throughout the Christmas season. I want you to pray for them and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. I want to dedicate this entire program today to a good friend of ours, Mr. and Mrs. Samples down in Madison, Georgia, an elderly couple. They love us and appreciate us and listen to us quite often, and I hope brother and sister Sample enjoying the hour today. That's a real blessing to them as they listen to the broadcast. Now, the scripture, John chapter 14, the message, Behold the Bridegroom Cometh, tape number 310. It was a night of destiny. Jesus, our dear Lord, sat in the upper room and talked with the disciples about his decease, that he be shedding his blood in a matter of a few hours. He often told them that he'd be leaving them. And he noticed they were very, very sad. And Jesus, as he gave the bread, said, Take and eat, this is my body. As he gave the wine, he said, This is the blood of the new covenant, the covenant that will be shed for the remission of sins for many. As they sat there in that upper room with a saddened heart from his disciples, Jesus gave these words, John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And what I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. In order to really understand what Jesus meant when he said he was going to the Father's house, prepare a place, and would come again, I must present to you the custom of the marriage engagement or betrothal that the Jewish people use in those days. From that you find a beautiful analogy of the church of what Jesus did as we bring to you here this morning. This message should be a message to be a real blessing to you so you listen closely and hear what the preacher has to say. In those days whenever a young man decided to go get a bride, of course he goes out to seek the bride. And then there must be a covenant made between the bride's father and the bride and the bridegroom. So he goes to the bride's house. When he arrives on the scene, and to the young man, then he begins to talk with her father about the price. He says, what is the price? What must I pay? And then they get together on the price to be paid. And so that is settled. When that is settled, then they take a glass of wine and the young Jewish bridegroom-to-be and the bride both drink from that glass of wine. When they drink from that glass of wine, that's a symbol of sanctification, or that this young girl is set apart in marriage. Now, a betrothal in those days was just as binding as a marriage. You must keep that in mind. So after that is done, she goes back into her father's house. He goes on his way back to his father's house. And then for a solid year, approximately a year, they don't see each other. He waits now for a year in order to go back and get her. 
But during this particular time, he's very busy. In those days, many times, whenever a young man was to be married or to bring his bride home, he would add to his father's house, or maybe just a room or two, or on his father's property, many times he would build a little new home for his bride. And for a year, he would be building that beautiful little home all the time he's thinking about his bride back there in the father's house he's engaged to. And since he'd drinken from uh, the cup of wine, that meant that she was sanctified, that she would not be going out with other men, that she would remain true until he came after her. And so she waited patiently for the year to go by, remaining true to the man she was engaged to. He works for a solid year, and he gets his um, home all ready and fixed up, the bridal chamber all set, and now it is time for him to go back and get his bride. So he leaves the house and he heads toward his bride's home. He gets his uh, best man, and he has escorts, and there's people standing along the street as they go down the way, and they're saying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And then that echoes down to the next corner. They pick it up there. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. By this time, they have a procession of a people with candles, a candle procession, great number. And as people see him going down the street, and the best man in the escort, they know what is taking place. And they sound out on further down the street. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And that sound goes all the way to this bride's home, her father's house. And she hears the echo. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And then she sends words to her uh, maids that is come, come and, and get her dressed. The bride maid to come and dress her. And they come and they immediately dress her. They have the dress ready, prepared, the veil and everything for him to come and take the bride. And they hasten them, dress her to get her ready for the bridegroom to come and get her. They march on down the street saying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And then he goes near the house. He doesn't go in the house. He goes near the house. And she comes out of the house and meets him on the outside and he takes her and they turn and they head back toward his father's house. When they arrive at his father's house, a number of guests are already gathered there in the banquet hall. He goes in, he goes by, he speaks to some, but he carries her right on to the bridal chamber. He places her in the bridal chamber and then his escorts and the best man and the bridesmaids are on the outside. And then when they go into that bridal chamber, he goes in with her, and that's the first time there's a union between the two. After remaining in the bridal chamber for a short period of time, he comes on the outside. He says to the best man, the escorts, and the bride maids, he said the marriage is consummated. When they're together, they're alone for the first time in the bridal chamber. Then when he comes out, he says that the marriage is consummated. And when he says that, then we find the escorts, they go to the banquet hall, they announce to the people, they say, the bride, the marriage is consummated. And they began to rejoice. And for a solid week, seven days, she remains in the bridal chamber. And for seven days, the number seven, keep that in mind, there they rejoice out there in the banquet hall, they're dancing. They're singing. They're having a wonderful time for seven days. Then after seven days, he brings her out of the bridal chamber, brings out the banquet hall. He, to the veil is taken from her. And for the first time, they see the face of this beautiful bride at the end of seven days. Now I want to give you the analogy between that and the church today. Jesus Christ our bridegroom, the church is the bride. You must keep that in mind. In that upper room, when Jesus passed out the wine, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. 
that I'm going to shed in a matter of a few hours to redeem my bride, the church. And the disciples, they sat there, they drank of that wine, they eat of that bread. Now that wine is a type, a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. On the cross, after a few hours, Jesus sheds that blood to pay the price there for his bride, the church. And he pays that price there on the cross. Now Jesus, of course, comes from the Father's house. Just like the young Jewish bridegroom left his father's house and goes to the bridesmaids uh, to the bride's home, then Jesus leaves his father's house and he comes down to the home of the bride. He comes down to the earth. And then on that cross, he pays that price. He sheds that blood to sanctify unto himself every true born again believer. When a person is saved and added to the bride of Jesus Christ, he belongs to the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You belong to me, saith the word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, he said, You're bought with the precious blood of Jesus. So here we find Jesus sheds his blood upon a cross, Therefore, the, the church, buying the church with his own precious blood. And then what happens? We find then um, that uh, Jesus comes after some 53 days. After he sheds that blood, he goes back to the father's house. Just like the young Jewish uh, bridegroom goes back to his father's house to prepare for a year. Uh, there a home for his bride. Jesus then goes back after the shedding of the blood. There on the cross, he goes back to his father's house. And then now for almost 2,000 years, Jesus has been preparing a place for us, a home, a mansion. That's what he meant here in John chapter 14, where he said, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now notice the beautiful analogy here between the marriage custom of that day and what's taking place today between Jesus and the church, his bride. See, we betroth to him. We belong to him. We're married to him. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7 that we're married to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus goes back to the father's house like the young Jewish bridegroom comes back to his father's house and that's where he is today. But wait, one of these days he's going to leave the father's house. Just like the young um, uh, Jewish um, uh, groom left his father's house to go pick up his bride. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to leave his father's house one of these days and he's coming back to pick up the bride. Now let's notice the analogy. We find here that this young bridegroom leaves the father's house. He goes down the street and they begin to cry out, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And he goes down to pick up his bride. She comes from the inside of her house out to meet him in the yard. He doesn't go in the house. He stands on the outside. And then when he comes near her house, she comes out of that house and she meets him on the outside of a father's house. That's what's going to happen in the future. We find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible said the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a great shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which alive remain shall be cut up together with him in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. Just as the young bride stepped out of her father's house. And met him on the outside. That is the bridegroom. So will Jesus come in the air. He'll not come to the bride's home. Which is the planet earth. She's on the earth. We are here. Jesus won't come to her home. Down on the earth. He'll meet her just on the outside. Up there in the atmosphere. And he'll be coming back to pick up his bride. Like the young Jewish um, uh, bridegroom went to pick up his, so will Jesus come to pick up his bride. I'm glad I'm part of that bride. If you're saved, if you're born again, 
then you're part of that bride. Yes, you belong to Jesus. You're married to him. You're not your own. You've been bought with the precious, precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we find then that they go, he goes after her with a great shout. And they still shout him, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That's what's going to happen when Jesus comes in the air. The Bible said he's coming with a great shout. And the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the contents of that shout, I believe, would be the same. I believe Jesus will cry out when he leaves the Father's house to meet his bride on the outside of her house, which is in the atmosphere, uh, which is away from the, the planet Earth, to meet him in the air. Jesus will come according to 1 Thessalonians 4, and Jesus will be said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. The archangel and the trump of God, and they're coming in the air. And then the bride will leave her father's house, or rather her home down here on the earth. And she'll leave her home, and she'll go to meet him on the outside of his father's house, and away from her home upon the earth. That's exactly what's going to happen at the rapture, when Jesus comes to take away the waiting bride. And then when he receives her, when Jesus receives his bride, then, beloved, he's going to take us back to his father's house. As that young Jewish bridegroom took his bride, came down that street with escorts and the, the, the torch procession, and that group as he came down that street, beloved, back to his father's house, when Jesus meets his bride in the air, what is he going to do? He's going to take us back to the Father's house. We're going to the place where Jesus went to prepare a place for us. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That a bride knew that one day the bridegroom would be back. That already been sealed. That already drank in the wine. Already made the vow. The covenant was made. And she was to be true and faithful to him. She knew he was coming back. No doubt about it. He said he would. He said he would come back. And so she waited for him. And Jesus is saying to the church today, his bride, he said, I'm coming again. I'm going back to my father's house. I'm going back and build me mansions. I'm going to build you a place on the other side in my father's house. And while I'm gone, remember you belong to me. Remember you're sanctified. Remember you belong to the new covenant. Remember, it was my blood that bought you. It was my blood that sanctified you. You don't belong to yourself. You don't belong to anyone. You belong to me because I bought you with my precious blood. Then is that the bridegroom comes back with his bride. He comes back and lo and behold, there in the hall where the people had met there in the place where they'd gathered and assembled together, there was a great number of people already assembled there together. And so they're assembled together there in that great banquet hall. And so he carries, of course, his bride into the bridal chamber. That's what the Lord is going to do when he carries us back to heaven. There's a great number of people in heaven. There's a great crowd there. There's some heavenly guests there. There are the Old Testament saints there. They're there in their soulless bodies. But Jesus will take us back to heaven. And when he carries us back to the Father's house, we're not going to mix and mingle with the, the Old Testament saints immediately. We're going into the bridal chamber. We'll be there with our dear Savior for a number of seven. Keep that number seven in mind. For a number of seven, we're going to be there in the bridal chamber. And then after we spent number seven in the bridal chamber, something else is going to happen. You may say, now preach, Edward, what is the significance of number seven? The number seven there has to do with a seven-year tribulation period. When Jesus catches his bride out, when we meet him in the air, away from the Father's house, away from her home on the earth, meet him in the air as he comes crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. We meet him, we go back into heaven, and for seven years we are there with him in the bridal chamber. And then at the end of the seven-year period, as, 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 the, as 
the bridegroom carried the bride out and then presented her before the great crowd waiting out there in the recreation hall. Then we find he had the, the veil taken from her. He took that veil from her. He goes out. He takes it off her face. And then he goes out before the people. And then he presents his bride to that great host of people out there that have been waiting to see her. The veil has been removed. That's what the Lord's going to do when he takes the church home. He's going to carry us to heaven. And for number seven, like the bridegroom of old, the Jewish custom was seven days. She remained there in the uh, uh, place of um, the palace there where they were kept, uh, rather in the bridal chamber. And of course, for seven days, none of them could see her. No one on the outside could see her. She was on the inside of the bridal chamber. And while we in heaven, the people on this earth is not going to be able to see us. We'll be there with Jesus for seven years. There in heaven, in the bridal chamber as it were. And then after seven years tribulation, what's going to happen? As the young Jewish uh, bridegroom carried the bride out before the people, and they beheld her without the veil, and they, amazed, they were amazed at her beauty and loveliness and the choice he made, and there they began to rejoice and began to praise God for what had happened. So when Jesus takes the veil from the church, as it were, and he said the number seven is up, I am taking my bride out of the bridal chamber, as it were. I'm going to carry her back to her home down on the earth. I'm going to carry her back to the position, the place where the guests are now waiting. And Jesus comes back down to the earth with us and sets up yon in Jerusalem. And then the people of this earth will behold the bride. She won't have the veil on. She'll be uh, seen by multitudes upon the earth. And we are that bride. Yes, we're married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And after the seven year tribulation period, we come back with him. Just like he presented uh, the Jewish uh, bride to the group out there waiting for them out there in the um, uh, recreation hall. Or where they, were, they had met to rejoice and they had to wait until she was revealed to them. So will this earth be waiting for Jesus to bring his bride back from heaven after the seven year tribulation period. And then we'll rule and reign with him upon the earth for a period of a thousand years. That will be the great honeymoon. And so now he has his bride back with him there in his house. And so shall we be with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the endless ages of eternity worlds without end. Oh, you may say now, preach Edward, what does it have to do with us today? You've given the analogy between the Jewish custom of marriage and the church that Jesus Christ is married to. And this is it. Now listen to me. You are not your own anymore. Just like when this young Jewish bridegroom went to her father's house and he was given her hand. And of course the price was agreed upon and he paid her father the price and they drank the wine from the cup together. That meant she was his. She was his. And she would remain true until he came back after about a year to get her to carry her to his father's house. Now you have been saved, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to God. You don't belong to yourself. You don't belong to your family. You belong to God first of all, and then of course your family. Now you must keep that in mind. Oh, you say, now preach Edwards, I'm married to Jesus. I know that. Romans 7 says you are. You're married to Jesus. And now since I'm married to Jesus, I'll just go out here and commit spiritual adultery. I'll commit spiritual adultery. Beloved, listen to me. If you go out here worshiping idols, that is spiritual adultery, worshiping idols, anything that comes between you and the Savior, since you belong to Him, is spiritual adultery. And if you commit spiritual adultery, then you grieve the heart of Jesus Christ, our bridegroom, to come for the bride. He doesn't want you to do that any more than a young man that's engaged to a young girl. And she's received the ring. And now she's engaged. 
And now does he want her to go out and hobnob around and run around with other men and go to wild parties and date other men and things that no, no. He says, you belong to me. You have my ring. I've given you the ring. You are mine. Now you remain true to me until time comes for us to be united in marriage. That's where it is here upon the earth. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You can't go out and do what you want to do or what others want you to do. And if you love that young man, you're not going to do it. If you're engaged that young man, you're not going out here to wild parties and run around with other men. You're not going to do it. And if you do, you're going to be ashamed whenever you face your Lord on the other side as a Christian. If you do that, if you commit spiritual adultery, you shouldn't. It. God wants your whole heart, soul, mind, and body. God said, you're mine. I bought you with a price. You belong to me. You're mine, saith the Lord. You don't belong to you. Say, oh, I'll do what I want to. Preacher won't tell me what to do. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm a Christian, but I'll do what I want to do. You better do what God wants you to do. You belong to him. And you're his. He bought you with his own precious blood. And if you go out and commit spiritual adultery, it's going to grieve the heart of Jesus. Jesus said, I'm married to that person. And they're out worshiping idols. And they're letting the affairs and things of this world come between us. And that's spiritual adultery. And Jesus said, it grieves my heart. And he's coming back after you. And you're going to regret that when you come to the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, you may say, now preach, Edwards. What does that have to do with the poor lost sinner? Well, for the poor lost sinner without God, Jesus is saying to you, will you take me as your Savior? Will you now take me as your uh, husband? Would you now become married to me? Would you let me be your loving Savior? Would you let me be your loving bridegroom? Would you not come to me and let me give you eternal life? Would you not come to me and let me do for you that that needs to be done? Oh, dear sinner, Jesus is saying, will you not now take me, Jesus, to be your lawfully wedded husband and belong to me the rest of your days and let me bless you and let me keep you and let me go and prepare a place for you in heaven and let me come back again and receive you unto myself. Dear Lord sinner, won't you be willing to do that now? Right now, won't you do it? You can say, yes, yes, Jesus. I want you to be my lawfully married husband. I'm the bride. Yes, I want to be yoked up with you. You bought me with a price. You paid the price. And now I'm ready to drink the wine and be sanctified and belong to you forever. I'm now ready, dear Jesus, for you to be my lawfully wedded husband. I right now receive you as my own precious Savior and Lord. Jesus said, dear sinner, if you will do that, you belong to me now. I will keep you. I will bless you. I will satisfy you. I'll take care of your needs. I'll watch over you by day and watch over you by night. Now I'll be looking forward to the time when I can bring you back to my father's house. And as we sit here this morning in this auditorium, as you sit there in the radio listen audience, you belong to the body of Jesus. You belong, you're the bride of Christ. You belong to him. You ought to be true to the Lord. That's what the apostle Paul meant in the first Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writing to church at Corinth. Paul said, I have engaged you. I've introduced you to Jesus. And I want to present you to him as a chaste virgin. I want you to belong to him. Paul said, I introduce you uh, to your husband. And now since I introduce you to your husband, Paul is saying, I want you to do the right thing. Don't bring a reproach upon Jesus. I introduce you to him. I want to present you as a chaste virgin to the great Savior on the other side. And that was a burden of Paul's heart. Oh, listen to me today, dear soul. You don't belong to yourself anymore. In the year coming up, 1988, you ought to make up your mind. One of these days, my husband, the bridegroom, is coming for me, and I'm the bride. And he's expecting me to live right and honor him 
and not be involved in spiritual adultery and be looking for him and be clean and pure and ready to meet him. Like the bridesmaid that came whenever the bride sent out the word, hurry, come quickly, get me dressed, put me on my beautiful marriage gown, get my veil. I want to be completely dressed. I want to look my best when I walk out of this house to meet that man on the outside of my house. And they very hurriedly ran and got the best, the most beautiful dress of gown that she had saved up. And the beautiful veil, they dressed her up. And when she came walking out of her father's house and met that Jewish uh, bridegroom out there in the yard, she was the most beautiful thing he ever laid his eyes on. She had been true. She hadn't gone out with other men. And for years she had been waiting and waiting and waiting for him to come back. And now he's come. And since he's come, she wants to meet him in the yard, dressed in her very best. And the Bible tells the book of Revelation that we make our own wedding gown. And we stand before God in our own wedding gown. Not, not God's um, righteousness, but our own righteousness. The deeds we have done, the efforts we put forth, the things we have done for Him. We'll stand before Him in that day in our wedding gown as far as works and good deeds and sacrifice and giving so forth is done. We go there because of His imputed righteousness and his robe of righteousness but we be rewarded according to the robe that we have woven for ourselves down here upon the earth are you living for jesus you know the lord he may come today our bridegroom may come from heaven with a great shout behold the bridegroom cometh behold the bridegroom cometh behold the bridegroom cometh and when he does away from this earth we'll go and meet him in the air, and he'll take us back to the Father's house, where he is now going to prepare a place for us. And whenever he gets that place all finished in due time, at a time we don't know, but in due time, God the Father knows he's coming back after us. That young bride, as she waited in her home for him to come get her, she didn't know the hour, the day that he was coming. She had to be ready at all times to go. And so we don't know the date or the hour, but we must be ready at all times to meet our Savior in the air, the bridegroom of heaven, when he comes back to get his bride. That's my message. God bless you. Stand to your feet. Father in heaven, we know there's coming a time when from heaven shall descend the bridegroom. And no doubt he'll cry out, Behold! The bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And we'll go out and meet him in the air. Oh God, lost sinners will not go. They'll be left here for that terrible tribulation period that shall come upon this earth. Is somebody here unsaved or in the radio listeners need to be saved? God save them today. Don't let them go to hell. We want them to go to heaven when they die. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. David, play something for us. Listen to me. If you're here unsaved, backslidden on God, I want to join this church, I want to come forward for any reason, maybe I haven't mentioned, would you come while she plays? Come on, if God is speaking,